Welcome to the second week of this introduction on public health engineering in humanitarian contexts. Last week, we have learned the principle of public health engineering and see how water, sanitation, hygiene promotion and vector control activities can have a significant impact to reduce the morbidity and mortality during a humanitarian crisis. This week, we will shift our focus on the humanitarian context itself. We would like you to get familiar with the humanitarian environment and its new challenges, and especially the one related to humanitarian response in urban settings during protracted conflicts. In this video on the introduction of humanitarian context, you will learn to describe different phases of humanitarian crisis in order to understand the scope of intervention needed accordingly. We will also talk briefly about the main stakeholders in the humanitarian system. And finally, we will discuss the main humanitarian principles and norms. There are different types of disaster. Some of them can be natural, with a sudden impact, such as the earthquake, tsunami, or with a slow onset, such as drought or famine. Some disaster can also be man-made, such as with armed conflict. And that will be the main focus of this course. Disasters interrupt the normal function of a community or a society and cause loss of life and damage to property and infrastructure that exceed the community's ability to cope using its own resources. When essential needs to sustain life such as water, food, healthcare, shelter are likely not to be met, action is required to save life, prevent further losses and minimize risk. This is what is done by humanitarian action during a crisis. Every humanitarian crisis has its own dynamic and evolution, but traditionally, humanitarian crises are schematized into four main phases. A pre-crisis where essential needs are met, but a risk exists that the situation will deteriorate. Therefore, preparedness measures are sometimes taken. Once a disaster occurs, we enter into the acute crisis phase, where essential needs are not met anymore. During this phase, there is a peak of search and rescue activities in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, followed by emergency relief activities aiming at stabilizing the survivor's physical and emotional condition. The primary focus is on life-saving activities and the overall affected community health status. This phase can take typically between one to six months. After, we enter into a longer phase, which is the recovery phase. The focus is on the rehabilitation and reconstruction to restore the level existing before the crisis. And finally, we enter into the post-crisis where development activities take place. However, nowadays we see a complexification of this traditional model with a growing number of chronic crises. Instead of having an acute crisis followed by a recovery phase, there is a succession of ups and downs over several years, even decades. Essential needs are not completely met and there is a high risk that the situation will return to acute crisis. This is often due to protracted conflicts that last for many years and that are currently a major driver of humanitarian needs. As a result of the increase of protracted conflicts, there is also a higher probability of multiple disasters, natural and man-made, occurring at the same time. In such complex contexts, the border between humanitarian action and development activities is getting very blurred. In addition to the traditional emergency relief, humanitarian organizations have to respond to the long-term effect of conflicts. It leads many organizations to have to play beyond their traditional roles and capacities in order to meet the needs of people affected by current humanitarian crises. In the humanitarian system, there are also entities which the primary mandate is to provide humanitarian assistance, such as the United Nations Humanitarian Agencies, 
International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement are national and local agencies with responsibilities for crisis response. There may be also other actors that play critical roles in humanitarian response, such as the private sector entities or diaspora. In an ideal world, all these actors should work in good coordination, but it is not always the case. Now let's focus on this humanitarian actor, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. It is a global humanitarian network of 80 million people that helps those facing disaster, conflict, health and social problems. It consists of three main components. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and the 190 National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Each component of the movement has its own legal identity and role, but they are all united by seven fundamental principles of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement that guide their humanitarian action. These seven fundamental principles sum up the movement ethics and are at the core of its approach to helping people in need during armed conflict, natural disasters and other emergencies. The first four principles humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence have been enshrined in United Nations resolutions, in state commitments and in pledges from numerous aid agencies, making them a rallying force in the humanitarian community and beyond. Another set of principles that most humanitarian action agreed to develop in the 90s is the SPHERE project. We have already seen it last week, remember. It contains the minimum standards of core humanitarian assistance, such food security and nutrition, health shelter, and water supply, sanitation and hygiene promotion. Its aim is to help improve the quality of assistance to people affected by disaster or conflict, as well as the accountability of humanitarian actors. Finally, an important set of laws that influence humanitarian action is the International Humanitarian Law, IHL, or also known as the Laws of War and the Law of Armed Conflict. We could talk hours about IHL, but rather, let's have a look to this short animation. Since the beginning, humans have resorted to violence as a way to settle disagreements. Yet through the ages, People from around the world have tried to limit the brutality of war. It was this humanitarian spirit that led to the first Geneva Convention of 1864 and to the birth of modern international humanitarian law. Setting the basic limits on how wars can be fought, these universal laws of war protect those not fighting as well as those no longer able to. To do this, a distinction must always be made between who or what may be attacked and who or what must be spared and protected. Most importantly, civilians can never be targeted. To do so is a war crime. When they drove into our village, they shouted that they were going to kill everyone. <gasps> I was so scared. I ran to hide in the bush. I heard my mother screaming. I thought I would never see her again. Every possible care must be taken to avoid harming civilians or destroying things essential for their survival. They have a right to receive the help they need. The conditions prisoners lived in never used to bother me. People like him were the reason my brother was dead. He was the enemy and was nothing to me. But then I realized that behind bars, he was out of action and no longer a threat to me and my family. The laws of war prohibit torture and other ill treatment of detainees 
whatever their past. They must be given food and water and allowed to communicate with loved ones. This preserves their dignity and keeps them alive. Medical workers save lives, sometimes in the most dangerous conditions. Fighters from both sides were wounded in a deadly battle. We were taking them to the nearest hospital. At a checkpoint, a soldier threatened us to treat his men only. We were running out of time, and I was afraid that now all of them were going to die. Medical workers must always be allowed to do their job, and the Red Cross or Red Crescent must not be attacked. The sick or wounded have a right to be cared for, regardless of whose side they are on. Advances in weapons technology have meant that the rules of war have also had to adapt. Because some weapons and methods of warfare don't distinguish between fighters and civilians, limits on their use have been agreed. In the future, wars may be fought with fully autonomous robots. But will such robots ever have the ability to distinguish between a military target and someone who must never be attacked? No matter how sophisticated weapons become, it is essential that they are in line with the rules of war. International humanitarian law is all about making choices that preserve a minimum of human dignity in times of war and make sure that living together again is possible once the last bullet has been shot. During this week, we have seen that the traditional model of relief, rehabilitation and development is changing due to a growing number of protracted conflicts and chronic crises. There are various actors, not always coordinated, that are struggling to meet these unprecedented humanitarian needs. The concept, as well as practices of principal humanitarian action, are increasingly being challenged, especially in current conflicts. However, in such complex and changing environment, this principle must remain a reference tool to guide humanitarian action. 